Okay, so the topic is invasive aspergillosis in febrile neutropenia. But actually, um, invasive aspergillosis can occur at any time uh, in the course of a patient's journey through leukemia and MDS, right? So sometimes they get it very early because some of them are neutropenic even at presentation and have been neutropenic for weeks and months. MDS patients in particular may have had dysfunctional neutrophils for a very long time. And then of course, when they have chemotherapy, there are bouts of neutropenia. If they come through all that and become eligible for a transplant, then that, that's uh, another bout of neutropenia during conditioning. And when they engraft, they may come down with graft-versus-host disease, necessitating steroids. So that's another uh, risk factor for invasive aspergillosis and other mold diseases. So I thought, uh, since it would be impossible just to limit myself to the neutropenic period, by right, the talk should be entitled Invasive Aspergillosis in Patients with Hematological Malignancies. Okay, uh, basically, um, the biggest risk factors for invasive aspergillosis are neutropenia and steroids. But when we uh, handle patients, we always pigeonhole patients into different categories according to their primary diagnosis. So I find this uh, slope uh, drawn up by Raoul Habrek and his colleagues very useful. Uh, giving us the uh, a gradation in the risk for catching or coming down with invasive aspergillosis. And the highest risk patients are those with chronic granulomatous disease. But in real life, that's a category of patients seen by a very small subset of physicians, right? Pediatricians, uh, immunologists. And for most of us working in a standard academic center or tertiary hospital, it would be patients who have undergone an allogeneic bone marrow transplant, patients with AML and MDS. And then after that, there's a whole long uh, list of other patients uh, whom we might encounter who are at risk of aspergillosis. Now, but in the course of this, uh, in, in this course, you also have realized that there are many other people who can be at risk of aspergillosis, those in ICU, those with liver cirrhosis, those with iron overload, and, and therefore, uh, this is another way of looking at it. There are many, many types of risk factors. For example, those exposed to a lot of environmental dust caused by construction. So there's a category here. And then, of course, there are many people with innate uh, immune status defects, one of which is very hard to diagnose. That's the TLR uh, polymorphism. And then, of course, there are these patients whom we do see all the time, patients with... Uh, structural lung defects, etc., who are also at risk of aspergillosis. And if you put them together, some people may have more than one risk factor, and that's why uh, you know, they may not have the most classical risk factor, but they do, in the end, still come down with invasive aspergillosis. Okay, so uh, from the earliest days of chemotherapy, people have realized that uh, many patients do come down with invasive mold diseases, and these do not get diagnosed. So as, as chemotherapy became more widespread, and as, uh, as the experts intensified chemotherapy, you find that the uh, percentage of patients who are dying with an undiagnosed antifungal disease was actually going up. So this is a very old autopsy series. And uh, invasive aspergillosis, of course, has a negative impact on leukemia survival because many a time physicians have to delay the next bout of chemotherapy. And, and uh, yeah, so, so with that, uh, I think there is a lot of uh, uh, di diminished survival. Okay, but over the years, uh, we have all become better at diagnosing uh, aspergillosis. This is uh, an MD Anderson review of all their autopsies from the 1990s to the present era. And you find that uh, you know, IFIs are nowadays less commonly found at autopsies. Of course, this study ends in 2008. Sorry. And then uh, you find that uh, for those IFIs that become evident only at autopsy, it used to be um, 84% last century, but it's only 49% nowadays. And then there's one more important finding, is that it is becoming less 
frequent as a cause of death. But, and this is also a theme that has come up again and again at this conference, there are more IFIs that are seen as antifungal breakthroughs. So I've already said this, these are the two biggest risk factors. Uh, these are two biggest uh, immune deficiencies predisposing to IFIs, to IA. Okay, what are the diagnostic modalities? I'll go through them uh, quickly in the interest of time. So uh, for when working with compromised hosts, we use this as a Bible. This is the EORTC guideline. And basically, uh, the patient has to full, be in, fulfill all these categories. First of all, the right type of patient. So that's the classical immunosuppressed patients, transplant recipients, those on CNIs, those on steroids. Uh, there must be a compatible clinical picture. And very interestingly, uh, for, for pulmonary aspergillosis, the clinical features are purely radiologic. Whereas if you want to diagnose a tracheobronchitis, uh, necessarily, it, it necessitates a bronchoscopy. Otherwise, you cannot see the ulcer or the SCAR in the large airways. And these are the microbiologic criteria. So one uh, host factor, one clinical factor, which is mainly radiologic, and then either culture, galactomannan, or an aspergillus PCR. Okay, let's look at uh, galactomannan. Galactomannan itself can form the content for one lecture, so I'll just show you a meter analysis. What's interesting is that the, the uh, sensitivity is about 0.7 in patients with hematological malignancies, but if you limit it to organ transplant recipients, the sensitivity is dismal, only 0 0.2, right? And yesterday, I think Dr. Lo Li Li went through some of the, the factors for this. Um, yeah, and then, of course, the next thing is the cutoff. What cutoff do you take? So if you take one, uh, you have a sensitivity of 0.79, uh, specificity is 0.87, and you raise it to 1.5, uh, you drop the sensitivity, although, of course, the specificity goes up. Yeah, so there it is. Now, uh, BAL, galactomannan, is also a very useful and important tool. This is a very well-known meta-analysis. They look at 30 studies. And uh, if you take 0.5 as the cutoff, now you will notice that the EORTC criteria actually favours a higher level. But anyway, if you take 0.5 as a cutoff, uh, the positive likelihood ratio was 8. And, and you can bring it up, you know, you can bring it up to 1, and then uh, sensitivity is not too badly affected, 0.87 down to 0.86, but the specificity goes up a lot, and the diagnostic odds ratio uh, actually goes up to, to a very high value. So that's why I think the cutoff should be one. Um, why, why, uh, now what about uh, beta d glucan right? beta d glucan will not be specific for aspergillosis, but uh, now this slide is not meant to denigrate beta d glucan It's a useful test to have, but it's a test that really must be interpreted in the context of the entire patient his medications, his underlying clinical condition, and what other treatments or interventions he is undergoing. So, for example, people have pointed out that uh, bacteremic patients, especially those with gram-positive coxemia, can have a false positive beta d glucan. Uh, those who are undergoing dialysis can have a false positive beta d glucan. Uh, the tricky thing is that you must know which, what type of membrane your dialysis machine is using. Uh, now, what about BDG in BAL? The, the, the sensitivity is similar, but the specificity is very poor. And of course, in many of the, our patients, especially those with hematological malignancies, they are receiving all types of blood products, and, and uh, beta d glucan can elute from cellulose membranes of the various filters that are used when we transfuse blood products. And therefore, if you go back to this slide, you will realize that BDG uh, is not part of the microbiological uh, bucket of the EORTC criteria. Now, aspergillus PCR, and uh, again, several speakers at this meeting have already alluded to this. Uh, and these come from very early thoughts from a fungal expert, Stephen Breton from France, uh, and, of course, they suggest that a positive result from BAL uh, must be treated with some, some caution. 
Right now, how you what about blood PCR? There are again some meta analyses, and they point out that you, you actually need to, to have two, two positives. Because if you use two positives, then at least the, the sensitivity was 64% and the specificity uh, 95%. And they conclude that for blood specimens, you need two positive PCRs for it to be indicative of uh, IA. Uh, this is a Cochrane uh, meter analysis. So, if you want to, to look at the, if you want to talk to colleagues, then uh, if a single positive test is used to define disease, out of 100 people in the setting where disease prevalence is 13%, three would be missed, right? That's a sensitivity of 80.5. But on the other hand, if you only take one positive PCR, 19 uh, of them. Uh, would be unnecessarily treated or subjected to further testing. Now, if you take two, if you take two positives, uh, things look really better. Uh, you, unfortunately, you'll miss six, but at least uh, only three would be unnecessarily treated or sent for further tests. So there is no standalone test. Uh, everything must be interpreted in the context and perhaps with other tests. So in this paper, they have access to both galactomannan and PCR. So if you use either, uh, if you use either test alone, just the PCR from whole blood or a galactomannan, uh, these are the sensitivities, right? Uh, very disappointing results. But if you take, uh, if you combine, or if you have this N slash or, then you find that the, the sensitivity is much better, about two thirds. And why does that happen? Because uh, it's not very well known and we don't have the, the time to go through that, but uh, basically we, we don't really understand the kinetics of fungal growth in the lungs and we don't understand the kinetics of galactomannan and DNA release by, uh, by the fungi. And so the belief is that combination testing gives us the best opportunity to detect biomarkers that may be differentially released at different times of infection. Because when you handle the patient in front of you, you don't know at which stage uh, of infection uh, the, the, the fungus is in that body. Uh, now, radiology is very, very important, and everybody knows about the halo sign. So basically, that's a dense nodule with a penumbra around it. That's the ground glass change. And when we say around, uh, we must understand that the lung is a 3D structure, so not just uh, to the left and right, as in this case, but you have to scroll up and down, and you find that the ground glass can be above or, or below that dense nodule, and that's, that's also around, right? Now, uh, these nodules in invasive pulmonary aspergillosis, they, they change in size with time, so this is an early study, and what they found was that uh, from day zero to day seven, day zero is the first day that the nodule was detected on CT, uh, there's actually a decrease in size. And it's only after that uh, that it begins to decrease in size. And in fact, this paper finds that uh, increase in size augurs well for the patient. It implies some uh, immune recovery. So there is some, some um, fight going on in the lungs or in the alveoli. So this is a, a standard, uh, uh, this is the way it tends to look. So that's the nodule with the ground glass change uh, around it. And then about seven or eight days later, you find that the area of consolidation has increased in size. And it's only uh, on day 20 that there's this uh, shrinkage. And it's many weeks or months later before the CT gets back to normal. So when they plotted the size, uh, this is actually a very big study, 80 plus patients. So when they plotted the size, they found that the size actually went up uh, in, in the first week or first 10 days uh, before it goes down. Right, so these are just some of the CT features that they describe. Now, uh, some groups have, uh, have uh, suggested that if you, you, you do a CTPA type of scan, uh, you can improve the sensitivity. And basically, they, they are making use of the fact that in patients with hematological malignancies, invasive aspergillosis is an angio-invasive disease. It goes into the very small arterioles, and in so doing, it causes an infarct. Right? So they are looking for, a, for this vascular occlusion or the vessel cut-off sign. So these are just some examples. As you can see, that's the vessel going up. 
And here the vessel is cut off. So this indeed was a case of invasive aspergillosis. Uh, this is another one, that's the nodule. And that's the vessel uh, not, not, not seen anymore once the nodule starts, right? Um, this is a false positive. This patient had uh, staph bacteremia with septic pulmonary emboli. So I think the mechanism is the same. It's just occlusion of small blood vessels and that's why there's a vessel cut off sign even in an MSSA bacteremia. Uh, and this is a true, true negative. So this is where you can see the vessel coursing through the consolidation. And in this case, this happened to be a pseudomonas pneumonia. But I think uh, CTPA is, is not very uh, popular in, with many hematologists or ID physicians because the addition of contrast uh, puts the patient at risk of contrast nephrotoxicity. And, and we know that the patient is already at increased risk of nephrotoxicity. There might be a need to use an aminoglycoside uh, or amphotericin. Some people um, are on cyclosporin or tacrolimus. So there are many reasons why we want to avoid additive nephrotoxicity in such patients. Okay, treatment approaches, and note the use of this word approach. There's no one... Uh, it's not just treatment. It's what, how, we, how we can... Uh, take this whole problem of preventing and managing aspergillosis in the setting of febrile neutropenia. So we can start with prophylaxis. Prophylaxis means you, must, you want to prevent a disease. So disease must not be there. Uh, and then there's something called empirical therapy. So this came about, like I said, because the early autopsy studies showed that many chemotherapy patients were dying with an undiagnosed invasive fungal infection and, and the, the ability to diagnose fungal infections in the 60s and 70s was very poor. So people decided that at some point they had to give an antifungal drug quickly and early. But with the advent of uh, fungal diagnostics, the, the concept of preemptive or diagnostic driven uh, therapy has gained currency, meaning that if you can use a certain marker, you, you don't need to, to give uh, antifungals empirically to a febrile patient. And finally, of course, there's targeted therapy that's given only after you have you know, proven the diagnosis, or at least after microbiological results. So prophylaxis, according to EORTC ECMM guidelines, uh, A1 recommendations exist only for people with hematological malignancies at high risk of invasive aspergillosis. So that's a very small group, AML, MDS patients, and, and they recommend postoconazole. And the other group that gets an A1 will be the allogeneic uh, stem cell patient with uh, graft versus host disease on high-dose steroids. And that, that's also uh, an RCT-proven paper. So this is a very well-known, very famous paper. Uh, this was published, wow, 16 years ago. This is an Oliver Connelly paper indicating that the risk of an IFI uh, was so much lower when posaconazole was used as compared with fluconazole or itraconazole. So we don't have time to go through all that. Prophylaxis of uh, IA alone uh, can take one whole lecture. Um, okay, so the issue is the persistently febrile neutropenic, right? What do you do if the white cell count cannot recover and, and the fever is 38 plus or 39 every day that you're staring at the patient. So, so uh, early this century, I think this sort of data could still be published. Um, this is the caspofungin versus liposomal amphotericin study. Uh, there was no difference in survival overall, but uh, caspofungin looked better, although it was not statistically significant, but many people stayed on caspofungin for a much longer time because of fewer side effects. So that's empirical therapy. Now then, of course, uh, like I said, you can use a diagnostic-driven or preemptive approach. This was popularized by Johan Martins, and more recently, he and his colleagues have conducted a, a proper RCT uh, to look at this method, uh, to look at this approach to the persistently febrile neutropenic. So in one arm, uh, they, they were randomized to the empirical arm, meaning after four days, then they would be started on caspofungin. And in the other arm, if there was uh, fever, they would be started on caspofungin only if one of these things happened, right? Like uh, positive galactomannan in the serum, 
or a shadow on the chest X-ray or a CT scan, or if they grew aspergillus from the uh, sputum, right? So, so, and these are the start, uh, These are the results. Of course, uh, basically, they get far fewer patients in the preemptive arm who who end up with caspofungin with no difference in survival. In fact, for 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 a period, it would it appeared as if the preemptive arm did better. Now, of course, uh, what you choose depends on the logistics in your centre. Uh, there's, no, there's no magic formula to the approach to such patients. Uh, preemptive arm means you need to have access to a PCR or a galactomannan, and all of them must come with very good turnaround times. So if you have to send it to a provincial or a state capital, then maybe uh, you cannot adopt the preemptive approach. So these approaches are there for you to adapt and modify in your own center. Okay, now we come to targeted therapy, and, and uh, this is the, the, the ESCMIT guide. Uh, you can do isovuconazole, we can do voriconazole, uh, or we can do liposomal uh, amphotericin. And, and uh, these are some of the papers. This is a very old paper that launched the career of voriconazole. Uh, this is a 2003 paper. Uh, the most rec uh, one of the more recent RCTs, Voriconazole versus Isavuconazole, showing no difference. And that's why Isavuconazole made it to an A1 recommendation in the ESCMIT guide. Um, when we look at the safety data, Isavuconazole may be a bit safer, uh, fewer in terms of uh, the ophthalmic effects much, much less, of course, in terms of neuropsychiatric effects and much less also in terms of uh, hepatobiliary uh, side effects. Now, many people uh, want to know why the combination of voriconazole and anidular fungin got a C, and that's because an RCT has actually been done, uh, indicating that there is no difference in survival. But... Um, there is a small subset who will benefit from having both uh, voriconazole and anidular fungin, and that's those who are GM uh, positive. So maybe in this small subgroup, it may be worthwhile. The expense uh, may be worthwhile. So in the middle of the pandemic, this paper came out. This is posaconazole versus voriconazole for invasive aspergillosis. Uh, if you look at, the, at table number one baseline characteristics, you find that uh, hematological patients, however, account for only about 25 or 30 percent of, of the population that were recruited. But basically, uh, this study, I suppose, establishes posaconazole as a viable alternative. Uh, the problem is that it is very important to load up front to start IV uh, because posaconazole oral takes five or six days to achieve steady state. And IV posaconazole, I think it's not very easily available. It's also very, very expensive. So in summary, uh, uh, great strides have been made against aspergillosis. Neutropenia and steroids are the biggest risk factors. With access to a variety of diagnostic tools, you can now develop different approaches to the problem of possible aspergillosis in, in hematological malignancy patients. Uh, prophylaxis is an option in the highest risk. And, and yeah, you can develop various approaches. Thank you. Okay, the next speaker.